And welcome back, or if you've just joined us, welcome. This is Beyond Gardens Live. I'm John Colwell, and I'm joined by John McWilliams and Gary Hetty. And we are live in the studio. Well, if you're watching on a Wednesday night, that is. Uh, but you might be watching a replay on Saturday. Saturday, yes. Saturday. 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 Well, Saturday. you might even be watching it on um, YouTube. But now, right now, it's live from WTV, and it's your opportunity to get in touch with us. Phone number's quite mm. simple. Six four six eight five double nine four. It's taken me oh, a long time to perfect that. Now. <laughs> In that case, you'd better do the email. Okay, email tv at beyondgardens.com.au and you can send those in all week. But it's not just uh, open for once as per emails. And please, send us photos. We love the send photos. Photo. It's a lot easier to answer the question when we've got those photos. <laughs> it helps if we know what we're talking about. Just a minor detail, but we do our level best. Now, um, I, I'm, I'm a, a little bit confused. Do we have still emails to catch up on, or do you want to move on to another myth? Let's go to another myth. Another myth. Another myth. Okay, mm. we can do that. Uh, let me find the right myth. I think that one will do us. Um, is it there? It says he looking at that. Uh, let me just try. It is there. I just took it away again. Okay, it's back, folks. Um, this myth is all about compost. Truly wonderful stuff. Before we get stuck into this myth, let me just state that I think we all agree that there is nothing quite like compost. Right? Um, we're not sponsored by any products, by the way, but we just happen to love compost. But the myth is that if you're going to be a good gardener, the only way you can become a good gardener is to make compost. Mm. And your reaction, please, gentlemen. <laughs> uh, Who wants to get in trouble first? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Personally, um, compost is absolutely fantastic. I personally don't have the time to be making compost at home. Um, what do I do with my scraps? Well, there's a lot of things I can do. Um, no, legally we're talking about John. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so you don't, you can, this is where worm farms come into it. This is where burying small amounts in the garden and moving on to another section of the garden mm -hmm. will certainly help. But the whole idea of compost is to get it hot. You know, a good compost yes. has to be hot. And to do that, you're almost turning it every day in the first couple of weeks to really stimulate right. those microbes. Yeah. I guess what John's saying, and what we're all sort of agreed on, that actually making compost is a dedicated task. And if you're not up to that amount of dedication, you're not going to make good compost. You're going to wait, go away disappointed and feel that you failed gardening 101. Yeah, so you're not almost not a proper gardener. And in my, young, in my youth, I used to spend hours trying to make the perfect compost but as i've got older i've got other better things to do i think your standards have dropped, dropped just a bit yeah <laughs> but the problem i have in my garden is i've got a gardening system where i just can't get the volume anymore so for instance all my lawn clippings go straight back with on the lawn where it came from so there goes one volume all my prunings are mulched up on the spot and put straight back on the ground where they came from that leaves food scraps now, food scraps can go into my slater farm. Oh, here he goes. Here we go. Here he goes. Or used to attract the slaters away from my seedlings. That only leaves newspaper, and that has virtually no nutrients in it anyway. So I just can't do it. Okay. So I have to exactly. go down the beach or something instead. Yes. Uh, I mean, this is exactly what we're saying, that, you know, don't feel, please don't feel you have to make it. And there are a couple of further steps that some people might advise you to go that we wouldn't necessarily agree with. One is you go out and buy an extremely expensive compost making bin, uh, up to $400, even more than that. Before you do that, can we advise you to check how much compost you can buy for the same amount of money? And the second one, which I've also heard, is suggesting you go out and buy material to put in your compost bin. It oh, sort of defeats the purpose, defeats doesn't the, it? Defeats the purpose. Okay, we've got a lot of calls coming through. Ooh, okay. um, people have uh, we're, we're ready. Attacking They've us made now. a cup of tea at, at the break, and, yeah. and so they thought, right, time to call. And, so. and a reminder, please, if you are calling, please turn down the sound on your television, otherwise you'll become totally confused. So will we. Um, so we have a caller on the line now. Welcome to Beyond Gardens Live. Hello. Oh, hello, it's Kay here. Hello, Hi, Kay. Kay. Oh, Where are name. you from, Kay? I'm from West Leaderville. Okay. Not that we'll, um, hold, not that we'll hold it against you, but uh, yeah. we, just, we just like to know. It helps. It helps us to understand. That's all right. We're like Subiaco. Lots of rain today. Fantastic. Um, a question on soil preparation for rollout lawn. I'm interested in your opinion on 
the sort of preparation that we need for a new lawn, the perhaps the depth of the loam, how much bentonite could go into it, and also your opinion on the height of the lawn in comparison to the paths next to it. Yes. Well, um, there's a few questions there yeah. that we could uh, happily talk about for about the next <laughs> 35 minutes or so, Kay, but we'll do our level best yeah. to keep it brief. Thank you. Absolutely. So just very quickly on the soil preparation, and we always go into this in, in our, our free workshops, uh, we need to add uh, no more than about 10% organic matter when it comes down to the um, to lawns, and also minimum two kilos per square metre of a clay, mixed into that 300 millimetre depth or 30 centimetre depth. And because lawn is a plant, we do, we do you know need to prepare the soil exactly the same as any other plant. Once that's... Um, thoroughly mixed through into that top 30 mm. centimetres, um, we can start rolling out what, that too. What we're showing you there, we do not recommend. No. Um, that is simply treating lawn as a carpet. Um, and if you do just roll that lawn onto crappy sand, um, we strongly suggest you take a photograph the day you roll it out, because it'll never look as good again. So it's worth, it's worth the investment, isn't it? That's what yeah, it's all about. it's definitely, you've got to think of it as a plant. And the other thing too is, be careful of landscapers' mixes because basically what we're saying is unless you need to raise the level of your lawn to make it a certain level, you don't need the sand that's contained in a landscapers' mix. Mm. All you need is the organic matter and a bit of clay because let's face it, you've got plenty of sand at Leadable. That's well, the, the, and the question we didn't really answer was what level should it be? And the answer is the lowest level on your house block. Try, we don't design homes very well from a water efficiency point of view. The lowest point on your whole block should always be the garden and everything should drain into the garden uh, because this heavy rain is the exception, not the rule. Little light falls that fall if the driveway is slightly cambered into the garden. If everything shoots water into the garden, that's the best way to be. Absolutely. Instead of which, we almost do the opposite at times. Yes, so hopefully that will help you there, Kay. Uh, we have to move on to the next call. Do we? Yeah, well, we've, we've got a, a, about 20 and calls. This is called oh, Rush so. Hour. <laughs> In the last 20 minutes or so. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we have another caller. Hello. Welcome to Beyond Gardens Live. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, it's Terry from Casuarina. Hi, Terry. Hi, Terry. Yeah. Um, what's the best treatment for fruit fly on citrus? I have never, ever had it before, and it's dreadful. Uh, yes, um, and it's, it's not an easy task to address. Uh, let's just talk about fruit fly overall. We are cursed with the Mediterranean fruit fly. Thankfully, we've got rid of the Queensland fruit fly, and we don't have that at the moment. Please don't try and bypass quarantine with all that fruit when you come in at the airport. Uh, but the Mediterranean fruit fly doesn't really like citrus, uh, but as our colleague uh, Peter Coppin points out, when they've got 200 eggs inside them, they've got to lay somewhere fast. Yeah, if they absolutely. can't find the right fruit, citrus will do. And as a result of uh, laying the eggs in citrus, we do get a mess. Did your citrus drop? Particularly mandarins are very bad with this. Yeah, mainly uh, lemons and oranges. Mm. Mm. They are desperate. They are, if they're going for lemons. Yeah. Yes. It's interesting, they've actually been known to sting um, honky nuts and a whole range of other things, so they're pretty desperate. Uh, you can go the chemical line, but let's face it, who wants to spray chemicals all over the countryside these days? And there's actually a, a mesh that you can put over now called a mite mesh, and that will actually prevent the fruit mm. fly from coming in. And you only need to have it up for a little while, a few months as the fruit ripens. And that certainly makes a huge difference. I can show you a picture of, that's the one in the background here. This is uh, a citrus fruit that has been, we use the word stung. What's actually happened is they've tried to lay an egg in it. As a result of the uh, fruit fly laying its eggs or an egg inside the orange, it's introduced other pathogens yes. and that's what you see. The black spot is where the egg was actually laid. Now the citrus senses this damage and if there's quite a few of them, and I think on this next picture, let's flick through to it, didn't go through fast enough. There it is. Um, on the next picture, you can see there are a few bits of damage on this one. And as a result of that, um, then the citrus tree will just drop the fruit. Is this what's happening to yours? Yeah. What's yeah. happened? Yeah. yeah. Real mess. Yeah. Uh, look, so we've explained the problem, but we haven't given you any cure, really, have we? Well, well I, I'm, I'll go for the mesh. 
Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, look, yep. when it's all boiled down, the, the chemicals, uh, it's complicated, and, and we, we don't have time no. to go into full detailed answer. Maybe come to our website and discuss this. Uh, but we have three methods of controlling the amounts of fruit fly. We have baiting, which is, you know, the bottles with a lure inside. Uh, we have foliar uh, baiting, which is um, chucking a, a bait, a lure, a thick paste onto the leaves, but that has to be done very often. And then we have cover spraying, the last treatment, in which we use a fairly strong chemical, which is now withdrawn. Yes. So we can't use that anymore. So this that... makes the physical protection, the might mesh, are much more attractive and in some cases the only alternative we have. Absolutely. Mm. Okay, Terry, well, hopefully that's helped you. Complicated. Uh, I should perhaps yes. add to that as, before we get to the next caller. Nowadays you can buy a lot of dwarf trees because putting a big net over, putting a net over a big tree is a real pain in the backside. Taking it off is even worse after yes. it's thrown through. <laughs> so nowadays with a dwarf tree it's much easier to manage, much yeah. easier. Absolutely. I hope that helps, Terry. Mm. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Terry. Uh, we do have more callers. So we do. Okay. So, uh, so that's the compulsory fruit fly, uh, and the lemon question. Is that our first lemon question. Go on. Um, first we... lemon question of the day. Yes. The first lemon question. <laughs> yes, oh, longer than you I thought. thought. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, do we have another caller on the line? Hello. Oh, hi guys. I'm. I live in Doubleview, America, and I've just and um, I wanted to have a. a uh, you know, yeah, nice grass field. So. Uh, can, can I just say, I don't know what's going on, but I'm getting every other word. I've got double view, and that's about as yep. far as I've got. So can we just start from the top again yeah, and try yeah. once more? Okay, sorry, guys. You there? Can you hear me? Yes. Well, better. now it's better, yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, my name's Troy. I'm from Double View, and um, I actually moved over from America to Perth, and I uh, live in an apartment back in America, and... I always wanted to have a, uh, a nice field of grass, and uh, I went and bought some grass. I, I don't know much about uh, gardening. I'm a bit of a, uh, a novice, so um, I kind of just got what I looked. Yeah, it looked good, and um, yeah, I got it. And it just wouldn't grow, and uh, I've got the name of the grass. It's named after a cartoon character. Do you guys... I can't remember what it was called. Ooh. Ooh, a cartoon character. <laughs> I can't remember, but uh, the problem I had is that it wouldn't I, grow, and I that? spoke to the neighbour, and he said... The way to get it to grow was to cut it, and I've cut it right back, Ooh. and it's still not growing. Yeah. Ooh, well, I, I don't that. blame it. I bet it's sulking by now. Yeah, um, yeah it's, I, I, I am... actually, it's called AstroTurf. Oh, that's oh, dumb. Oh, that's... go away. You haven't. I've cut it, and I've put manure on it, and I've forgotten. My neighbour told me to cut it right back, and oh, it's yeah. not that's growing cool. back at all. It, it's uh, not growing. Now, now, for those who aren't yeah. familiar with what I call us up to, um, AstroTurf is plastic carpet, right? okay. not real yep. stuff. Yep. Okay. Um, so I suggest, it's only a matter of time, by the way, and in fact, I think I make a lot of money with this scheme, so don't tell anybody. I'm going to make a fertiliser for artificial turf. I reckon I'd sell heaps. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So and Then uh, I'll make a special vacuum for artificial turf. Absolutely. But um, I have this... I know you want to cut me off. Just one thing. It's not artificial turf. It's not artificial grass. It is neither grass nor turf. It is... Plastic carpet. Yep. Please remember that. Bear it in mind. That's what it is. Absolutely. Okay. So hopefully does that we show have a certain a, bias? Yes, it hopefully does. Hopefully we have a, a good call this time. Oh, <laughs> so well, it gives, more it gives us an opportunity. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Hello. Welcome to Beyond Gardens Live. Oh, hi, panel. Dam Damien calling from Churchlands. Hello, Dave. Damien. 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 Yep. Damien. Yeah, uh, just a question on uh, dwarf and semi-dwarf apple trees. Yes. Just wondering if, any, if there's any low-chill variety suitable for the Perth metro area. Um, probably. Uh, well, uh, yes. one of the interesting things is that, that uh, the apples, for the major part, aren't too fussy about low chill. Some of the other stone fruits are. The apples are generally not too fussy. Um, so there are a few around. My personal favourite would be um, the dwarf form of Pink Lady, which is known as Pinkabell. Pinkabell. It's a lovely one. Yep. See if I can get a picture of uh, that one. That one that John's just mentioned there, uh, Damien. Uh, that I, I'm uh, in the northern suburbs, and we're getting apples off it right now, actually. And we've actually had some good crops, and it's only been in its first year. So, I would certainly be recommending that one mm. for the Perth area. Uh, it's uh, it's almost full size. The the fruit you can see that's the fruit of Pinkabell behind me. So it's very much like Pink Lady. Now, studio crew, bear with me. I'm going to do a flick of picture. There we go. Um, and that's what the uh, full plant looks like, okay? 
so that is probably about mature. Maybe it'll get a little bit bigger than that. Um, a, lovely, a lovely tree, and I would recommend it to you. And I've had one, and it's the only tree. We talk a lot about cross-pollination. The only tree sets an adequate amount of fruit. True, it may set more were they, say, a golden delicious around town. Yes. But on its own, it's fine. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Right. Yep. Yeah, so go for it, Damien. Yep. Good one. And you can grow it in a pot. Yes. For a considerable period. And maybe that's another topic we can talk about later. Yeah, we'll do a special sure. one on that one. Um, yep. So hopefully the, the people that sent the, uh, the emails in, they would have um, actually, uh, that would have hopefully answered some of their questions. Um, that's we a lot of emails. Have an, we have another call to go to. Okay, well, one more call, then we'll do a couple of emails. Yes, we need to, to yes, calls. absolutely. Hello, welcome to Beyond Gardens Live. Hello. Hello. Well, yes, yes, you see there's that. You have to turn the television down. I can hear it in the background. Hello, can we try again? Hello. Hello. How long will it take my sweet potatoes to grow sweet potatoes? Just every word of that. I, uh, I'm sorry about this. We do have a little few bugs in our, not landlines, I decided they should be called land vines. Um, <laughs> and the bugs meant that we really didn't catch any of that. I'm sorry, can you give it to us again? Yes, no, have we lost our caller? Um, are, you, are you actually talking to me? Uh, yes, I am. Because uh, I was second in line and I wasn't realized I was next. Well, look, I tell you what, welcome to the garden. Uh, I'm talking to you now, hello. Okay, hi. It's Iris from Craigie. And yes. I'd like to say, um, I was at the Cockman House last weekend. Yes. Oh, yes. And I was the one that had the strange plant to identify as the crawling spinach. Yes. So I yes. really enjoyed it. I would recommend any to come. Yes. Uh, and, uh, okay. Um, Very quickly. Yes. Um, I can kill most things. But I've got a, um, a bleeding heart vine. A bleeding heart vine. Okay, look, we're going to have to leave that there because we've got some serious problems with the sound on your end. Uh, and can I remind our callers, please, you ne must turn the television down. You must turn it down. Otherwise, you'll suffer what you heard there. The bleeding heart vine is, um, mm, is what's it called? There's a bleeding heart tree, which is on Melanthus, the bleeding heart <sighs> vine. Uh, mental block. How are you going with that? It's Thompson I. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll cheat. Because we can. Because you can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and here we go. Clerodendron Thompson I is what we're looking for. All right. And uh, this is what it looks like when it's in flower. It's, um, it's a lovely tropical beastie. Have we got it there? Yes, there it is. Lovely tropical beastie. Now, there's often more red involved when it's in early flower. But if you want to grow one, warm, protected spot. You can't expose it to the elements because... It will sulk. It doesn't like it at all. Quite a fast-growing vine, though, once you've got it going. Have you ever grown that one? No, I've never actually grown that uh, one. Our caller did say she specialised in killing things, and, and this might be another one on your list, I'm afraid, because it's, uh, it's quite easy to knock off. But well worth growing. It's quite glorious when it does grow well. Yes. Um, OK, now I promised emails. Let's do a couple of emails. Yes, absolutely. First? OK. Um, let's have a look here. Oh, we actually have a photograph here. This is from uh, Frank in Moore River. Hi, my passion fruit tree is loaded, but they have thick skins. Is this oh, normal? Oh, oh. Um, unfortunately, a very, very common problem. Yes, there's uh, the, have a quick glance over yeah, there. I'll, I'll just have yep. a quick look at the picture. It's not, actually, it's not too bad. No, um, it's, no, it's, yeah, no, they're it's look, better, better than yours, did you say? No, better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're looking okay. quite healthy. Um, let, me, let me get up uh, a couple of pictures of passion vines, and we can probably show you what we're talking about. Um, what happens with passion vines is the thickness of the skin is determined by really temperature and how fast the fruit grows, perhaps more than anything else, with another determining factor, and that is obviously the variety. And then on top of that, if there are other grapevines nearby, one of the unknown problems, or at least not appreciated problems with grapevines, is if uh, grape grape vines, passion vines, if you have two different ones and they cross-pollinate, you probably won't get very good fruit at all. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful about that. Um, okay, uh, but in this case we have fairly thick flesh, but the plant was, um, you know, the, sorry, the fruit's just been cut through. And to be honest with you, to our caller, I'd be quite happy with that. Yes. 
Pity, I'm, I'm just desperately no, trying to drag up the image, I, but I haven't been I able to do so. Personally, wouldn't be too worried about you that. You wouldn't one be too worried about that? No. Okay. Nope. All right. Let me go. Fruit trees, apples not growing. See, I. Yep. Go. Um, okay. All right. Let's do another email. Yes. We won. Um, Gary, do you want to? Get onto one there, or what have you got? I'm still going. Okay. Oh, I'm <laughs> okay. I've got heaps. Of I have okay. a email here from Trudy in Duncraig. Thanks very much, Trudy. She would like to plant an edible hedge or vine on our fence on the east side of our house, one meter away from the building. The spot only gets a few hours of light from late morning to early afternoon. What would be the minimum time of sun needed? Any suggestions of great plants to use would also be appreciated. Mm. Edible hedges are. Um a bit of a challenge. Mm. Yeah, I must admit I've never really put my mind to that before. Yes. So probably thinking on our feet as we go. Uh, there are very few plants that will accept the sort of pruning that you want to do to create a hedge and also produce fruit at the same time because the fruiting is an essential component, obviously. Uh, yes. If you want a hedge that's going to stop everybody dead in their tracks, <laughs> there is one quite attractive one. I'll see if I can get a picture of it up. Um, tough as a boot. Uh, it comes from South Africa. Uh, here we go. All right. And it's called Carissa. Carissa grandiflora. Um, <laughs> You're evil. Jim. You could al almost classify it as a weed. Uh, these are the fruits that produce it. I'm not sure whether you can see there. It has a couple of, of thorns that sort of go out like that. And oh boy, are they nasty. Um, but the flowers are quite attractive. Look, let me show you the flowers. Bear with us, guys. There are the flowers. Oops, well, there were the flowers, very briefly. Um, and uh, following the flowers, you get the fruit. Now, one more picture, and that's what happens when you prune it to a hedge. Not bad? Yeah, mm. absolutely fantastic. Not bad? Absolutely I'm thinking, what about, a, yep. what about a lily pilly? Lily pillies would work. How much fruit they'd produce in that much light would be yes. better. Yeah, they the might issue. get a little bit Your leggy. regular pruning would tend to I'm take also, the flowers and therefore yeah, the fruit I'm off. I'm also thinking some of our um, bush foods, maybe the midium berry. Midium berry, um, yes. They, yeah, there's, yeah, there's a couple there that, that may, may do quite well as well. I think the principle here, let's just wrap this up, is that if you regularly prune something, your chances are you're going to prune the flowers off. Um, so many people who grow some plants like bottle brush, uh, for an ornamental hedge and for flowering, stop pruning about two months before flowering time. Otherwise, they keep pruning the flowers off. Interesting question. We'll consider that further. Uh, where do we go from here? Should we talk about our website at this yeah, stage? Okay. We, because upcoming, time's running out fairly fast. workshops. Yes. We've got some workshops coming up. Oh, well, okay, workshops. Yes, workshops. or our website. Workshops. Workshops. We should workshops. have a website coming yep. up. Yep, um, let okay. me find the workshops. Yep, here so we go. for those of you who haven't been to our um, our website, this is it. <laughs> yeah. And not, not yes. too hard to find. <laughs> so Beyond Gardens. .com.au. .com yep. What we were highlighting this one is, is this is the central point for all of our workshops. You can go into our events calendar and find out what we're up to, where we're going. We have e-learning courses that you can do. And one really good one there is what we call the Florum, which is on our social network page where we currently have 1,200 members that it's free. You can yeah. go on there and ask us these very same questions in a forum. So uh, if you miss out this time, uh, it's a very easy way of getting hold of us. And there's a swag of stuff on there, including, of course, all our workshops. So let's talk about the workshops we have coming up now. Um, these are in the near future. They go on through the year. Um, but the, uh, the first, oh, it'll come up in a moment. It'll be, um, yeah, it'll be there, don't panic. Um, if we can, in its, in its own good time. Um, no, okay, it's not going to get there. Maybe we should talk about something else. Could we have the workshops up, guys? It's, it's up there? No, no that's, that's not it. Oh, no, no, the other one. Yes, okay. No, there, there we go, go. There lovely. Is. Okay, all right. We get there eventually. This is live television, <clears> or is it? You might be watching a replay on Saturday, or you might be watching it on YouTube. On YouTube. Yeah, okay. Series. All right, <laughs> let's get to the workshops. First workshop coming up, Thursday, 16th of May at Harrisdale. That's a nighttime one. Yep. So Harrisdale is out near the, what, between Armidale and... Um, and somewhere else. Somewhere else, Coburn. Okay, well done. And uh, it's a 6.30 one, and this one's going to be a, a hybrid. So you get to talk to another colleague, um, Steve McCabe, about bush food. Um, foodscaping, okay. that sort of stuff. All right, so that's Harrisdale. Yeah. And then coming up after that, but we've lost it again. We've lost be it back again. In yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Your memory. My memory's, Our memory's lost not it good. Again. We, we go. have here, here uh, Morley on Morley? Friday afternoon Morley on, Friday. on 17th of May. That's a, a okay. daytime. That's, that's a daytime. Garden yep. wise. And those are free workshops. Yep. We have one other free workshop. Can we aim that? Uh, John, John, quick. That's Les Murdy. That's a nighttime one. Yep. Um, and uh, basically it'll be 
focusing right. on the hills type gardening? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Start talking and about some heavy. The last soils. one on our list there tonight is the Gidjigan Up Show. It's interesting because the Gidjigan Up Show is not a free workshop for us uh, because you will have to pay to get into the show. But actually, we've got some free tickets to give away to the show. How are we going to do that, Gary? Quickly. Yeah, so very quickly, we've got 10 family passes to Gigi Gannup Show. It's only 15 minutes from, from uh, Midland, so it's a okay. really great place to go. And what we need you to do is email us on tv at beyondgardens.com.au. Put your name down, and we'll pick 10 lucky families that okay. can get to go to that. Time's beating us. Mm -hmm. um, can I thank you for joining us? Can I thank my colleagues, John McWilliams, Gary Hetty? Can I thank our sponsors, the Water Corporation, City of Bayswater, City of Stirling and the City of Mandurah. And mostly can I thank you for your company. We're going to do it all again, same time, next week with all its challenges and all its bugs. But geez, it's fun. I hope you've enjoyed it this week. We look forward to your comments and we look forward to your company again. I think about exactly the same time, same station next week. WTV, 6.30 on a Wednesday night. Goodbye.